supposed to be meeting music. I was told I would do it. Archives director for the Company, Jim Hanson.
in a small New England town and the surrounding countryside, fully 80 to 90 percent of the film will be shot on location, mostly outdoors, to take full advantage of the fall colors and to capture the authentic flavor of the region. And I think that, that visual palette was really important to Jim that it show up in the movie. I think he's been so successful with that. What's, um, what's funny is because we had to shoot in Vancouver in the summer, the fall foliage and everything went away. But the, the, the uh, forests in Vancouver, they're rainforests, but they're not tropical. They're uh, Acadian, I think it's called rainforest. But they were used in Planet of the Apes to be near woods. And they are magical. I think we have some pictures here. So it's a different look. And the whole point was we had to change the story to say the family was going to the Pacific Northwest for Thanksgiving where the colors don't change. But it's green all year round. We even named the forest the Siempre Verde Forest, meaning it's always green. And, and the moss there, the trees, which we used in the movie, actually, we rewrote the script to take advantage of. The trees are covered in inches of his feet of green moss. They look like uh, Oscar the Grouch. <laughs> and they're giant, they look like giant green furry spiders. It's so fantastic, these woods. So we kind of traded the fall autumn thing from the England for this amazing uh, Pacific Northwest which was so the the energy of the magic of the forest was still kept, but the, just a different color scheme. Mm -hmm. That was kind of fun. Yeah, we got to just want to say a little bit about the dead and trees, because he was always obsessed with trees. He loved trees. He did a lot of artwork about trees. He did paintings of trees. He did photographs of trees. And he always felt that trees had personality. And then when you look at that tree, you really get a sense of the character and the personality of that tree. So I love the scene where he
Well, Robbie, he tweeted me this morning. Um, so he has this deep voice. The idea with each character has sort of a different register, so Verbal's got the deep voice, and you'll see in the clip. So, uh, and he's sort of, and also the puppeteer, Robbie Day. If you work with the Henson Company, the puppeteers are a huge part of it. It's not like an animated show where sometimes you create the character, you kind of design, and then just tune the voice. So they bring a lot to it. So Robbie's a big hand, and you can never shut him up. And so Verbal became sort of the big hand of the group. And, uh, you know, I worked with this character. In fact, we sort of try and cast the puppeteer, so their personality works for the puppet. So that's a lot of the fun of directing, uh, especially original uh, creatures, not, I mean, that's great to direct the Muppets, but they're already kind of decided. So it's fun to sort of put the person in the puppet for the character, so that's a good part of it. And you can see a little bit of the, of the sort of build process where they make the, the models, um, and they cast in, I guess. Oh yeah, they all the different fur. Hasn't changed at all. There's still lava lamps and, and, and you know, almost with the posters. So 
Uh, that was kind of fun. Um, there was a lot of detail in the movie that was uh, tied into the Henson family and uh, you know, the Jane and Jim and, and little little moments. Everyone, uh, we all put our mom's names in the movie somewhere, whether intentionally or by uh, sort of by happy accident. It's kind of cute. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a very personal project for, for all of us, even for Mary, who um, you know, came in late in the game. But yeah, it's just, I think you'll feel the the love that everyone had for it. Um, I think when you see it, at least I hope you will. Yeah. Um, so, I'm going to go to the clip now. Yeah. 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 I won't tell you where it is in the movie, but it's a fun little moment. It's very interesting. Because I want you to watch it. I'm going to take it out.
talking to each other at all. And in fact, there you know, was maybe sort of a desire not to, you know, to do two, two different artists' takes on, on the story. But the story, there's a rough draft, and, and it's a 15 page outline, and then a nice typed version that got sent around by Bernie Wilson, who's the manager and agent. Um, and then it just sat there. I mean, I think Jim and Jerry obviously knew it was there, and they wrote all these other things. So besides these two muck things, they were writing things like the cube, which was a solo and two drama, um, with only people that they produced for NBC in 1959. Um, Hate Cinderella, which was a television special that didn't get made. Um, and uh, so they were just throwing everything in their arsenal, um, and eventually, Getting a lot of shows made, and of course, the last show, ultimately. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the script really sat there, and then. Um, it was an outline, it wasn't a script, actually. Yeah, it was an outline. The 15 page outline, which is the outline. And when they found it, they basically brought it and said, hey, would you like to turn this into a, a you know, TV special? So I would, I would be very honored and I'd love to. So I turned it out a 22, 25 page beat out line for a movie. Really, an hour long special. So, we kind of had to fill it out um, and add some elements and kind of make the plot make sense for a two hour, 88 minute production as opposed to a 44 minute production. Um, and so, then it went through finding financers and all that. And it, uh, the Canadian uh, companies were interested, so they, due to rules and regulations in Canadian content, uh, they were going with a Canadian writer, Tim Burns, who worked on Dog City for a <laughs> and I wrote the Dog City uh, TV movie. You saw that, and he worked with us on and on various projects. So he did the first few drafts. And then Lifetime picked it up and they brought it in and brought Chris Ball on, who did the last couple drafts. And then I came in to direct it and did the final kind of polishes and changed things just to make it, because we had to move the location too. So we went out to Maddie Jack, like details and things that were very production specific. So a lot of people worked on it. There were a lot of parents involved. And, uh, and that's. Probably the, um, that was the process of the screenplay from outline to the screenplay. Yeah, and the graphic novel, we were working with Arkea, who publishes a lot of our graphic novels, and we had done another project from the archives called Tale of Sand with them, which was, um, they did a beautiful job with. And so Lisa worked very closely with them with them, and so she was enthusiastic about getting a shot at something else. And um, this obviously was a script or a project that she had great affection for and was pursuing on the on the movie image side, but um, also provided the outline to Arkea and they got Roger Lindrich, who's done a lot of lots of hard comic books and things like that. Um, and so he took off and did his take on it, um, which is different from the movie, but also wonderful. And um, we're thrilled that these things have a second life and we get to challenge Jim and Jerry's ideas and get it out there in various ways. <laughs> Cheryl, besides like the craft at home, how often was the family involved in production? Like when you did a photograph and when you would go to like a parade? Um, we didn't really play with the puppets. The puppets were always considered a special thing. Um, but we went to the studio a lot. And we had to be very, very quiet. I learned to be extremely quiet and very much not to let my foot step with any sounds at all when I thought the studio was. That's true. Um, but then I started building puppets when I was 15 on Mother Show and built Steamy Boots and Dice Tools and uh, Lobster Bandicoes. <laughs> my fastest puppet ever was a bear that, that was written in the industry in very much by Joe Bailey and I built it in a little lunch break that day. <laughs> um, so I had a lot of fun getting to, to build puppets. Um, we, uh, as soon as we were able to handle it professionally, we were invited to participate. And my brother Brian got very involved with the props department and was in the props office on pricing off and trying to out the creative control mechanisms and stuff, and then became very instrumental in development of the Jesus and Creature shop. And then went on to be a director and uh, an executive director for all kinds of public projects. And has a new film called Second Time Murders that he's in pre production on right now. And we are very excited about Second Time Murders. Thank you. We're going to a script and we hope that all the adults 
the students who were old enough to be able to involve. But as kids, um, we're invited into the workshop, we're invited to the studio, and there's Captain Pussy and Great Monsters. <coughs> It's our goal to like bring the project to life, you know, to make it the floor that you're doing it at. It was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> Tough question. It was great. I mean, working with something that Jim and Jerry had created and, and having fun with the, the company saying, you know, kind of doing what you think would work with it, that was awesome. So, you know, uh, it's it's interesting working with Lifetime actually because they're not known for comedy. They're actually known for like Lucky Joy Murder or whatever they're other. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and they did the the Grumpy Cat movie last Grumpy Cat's Christmas. So that was their first attempt, and I don't think they were happy with it, or at least they weren't happy with the ratings. Um, so I think they were trying. I think this was another kind of it's much more of a family film. I said it's kind of more of a feeling of DT when you say like that kind of energy. Like it's fun, and there's sweet moments, and there's ridiculous moments. And you know, at the end, you feel good. It's it's not, um, but you know, it's not the hangover. Uh, uh, although there were moments, uh, particularly with the bodily functions of verbal. Um, so I mean, it was really fun, and, and pretty much got tons of support from from the family and Lisa, and, and even Lifetime. So that was great. And the nice thing is, it wasn't a preconceived. You know, doing the monthly stuff is awesome, but there's you know 30, 40 years of what Gonzo does in the positive. So you're more like managing, and this was pure creativity. And this is the kind of stuff that Jim, when I work with Jim, that's what we'd like to do, make up new stuff. And um, I know that's really the core of who he was and what the company was, was inventing new things and new characters and playing. So I got to do all that, so I'm very happy. And that's something that Karen was talking about some before, but I just wanted to say it again, that um, that just kept making new stuff. And that's what he really, really enjoyed doing. And before Mocha, before Sesame Street, he was, they were so prolific in trying to come up with something that would, could get into production, you know? And that people kind of think, oh, he was, somehow he was magically blessed and got this great gig on Sesame Street and then Mocha. It's like, oh, no, he must have tried a hundred different things before those took. And a hundred afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> I worked on two projects. I, I've written five months of movies that never got made. I worked with Ron Medjib on a project called Mountain Voyager, which never saw the light of day. So that continued, and that was what was so great about working with the company. And that sense of just don't give up. You know, just yeah. keep on trying. Keep on throwing up the go off. See what sticks. And I want to put in a little plug here for the Center for Puppetry Arts New Museum. It's Great on, and so there are a couple things um, 
that we pull out. Um, I love to tell the stories about these projects. And you mentioned Muppet Voyager, which was a project uh, Jim had met with the European head of IBM, who said, if you had an unlimited budget, what would you want to do? If you tell Jim Henson that, you can't imagine. But it was, a, it was an interesting sh show about you know, columns and understanding. Changes the world. Yeah, and the guys from aliens. Right, so it's alien planning and sort of kind of traveling that really. Um, work. Yeah. Coming back yeah. to work at the end of every important meeting, we go, Larson, I learned this. And so it was kind of that gag of these creatures and getting things always wrong. That was the travel. Right, right. And it was kind of to, so they could, you know, and it was going to be international, so in, in every culture, and so it wasn't going to be from a point of view. But, um, but that's a really cool thing, and we have great art subjects on it, and we have, um, no, no, you do. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, scripts and letters and things. Um, one of the things that we've done to make that available is our website, and the Jim's Red Book, which um, has 750 entries from his journal, and um, I'm going to talk about some of that later tonight, but um, there's lots of great information about unknown, left known, undone projects, and uh, it's inspiring to see the sort of breadth of the creativity and the persistence um, trying to get things done. I think you can try to take some questions. Do we have a microphone we can use for that? Yeah, we did. So if you want to, people want to line up somewhere, Charles has it over here. And while you're getting that, um, we do have some signings coming up. Uh, Kirk Thatcher is going to be selling autographs and signing that Aurelia on Saturday from 4 to 6 p.m. in the Marriott A703, which is the room next to the public card room. And uh, Cheryl and Karen will be doing, will be signing uh, Saturday 11 to 12 in that same room. That's, that's not in the schedule. Not yet, not in the schedule. That's so secret. <laughs> we don't want millions of people away. Oh, <laughs> Scratch that, tell everyone you know. <laughs> I think you mentioned it on the Publisher Track Facebook page, maybe. Yeah, this all happened really late, so we're not, I'm not even going to book. Yeah, yeah. There's no pictures and nothing about it. Oh. 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 Thank you. Yeah, here you are. Big warm hug. But <laughs> well, that's just the weather. Questions? <laughs> uh, yes, I had a question about the uh, the archives and the, the amount of wealth of media that's been generated, and with like one-time show thing that they showed on some TV station and then never saw the light of day. Is there any kind of way that that is being digitized to be viewable in some way, or is it a lot of licensing issues? Yeah. Yes. Yes. There, are, there is a huge wealth of material, and, and the way we've been able to show a lot of it is through our Legacy Foundation. Um, we do these sort of traveling screening series at uh, educational institutions and museums. Um, we're going to be at the Melbourne Center for the Moving Image or something like that um, later this month, I think. In Australia. In Australia. Yes, yeah, so oh, in Melbourne. Down. Um, <laughs> 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 the gallery. <laughs> haven't been seen before, and they'll be doing screenings as part of their program <coughs> forever, because it's a permanent Jim Henson Gallery. Um, and the Museum of the Moving Image in New York as well is doing tons and tons of screenings. So that's sort of the way we can get things out that um, the rights may be able to drive with us. This is the Paley Center. Oh, the Paley Center has a library. in Paley in New York and LA. Um, and it, yeah, the University of Manhattan Performing Arts Library has a large collection as well. Where do you learn the inspiration from the storyteller came from? Uh, the storyteller was John Hurd. Because um, that was like, I found it on Netflix and then just like, I watched the whole thing walk out because it was just so much fun. Um, and I also heard a rumor that there's a Labyrinth reboot or sequel coming out. And are you guys we had a bet how long it for someone asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> I guess technically it's one question. Um, I'll talk about Storyteller a little bit because I was working with my father at the time that that all happened. And uh, Duncan Kenworthy is a wonderful producer who was working very closely with us and was actually running the Creature Shop for a while and then moving more into other productions. And he had strong connections with the BBC and with Mark Schittis, who was an excellent executive producer with the BBC. And 
um, my sister Lisa was also studying folklore mythology and was very interested in, in folklore mythology and had done a lot of work in that area research and she's just fascinated by those kinds of stories. Um, I think also my father, ever since the late 50s, um, after he was doing Sam and Friends for a little while, for a few years with my mom, um, he went to Europe and did his European trip where he got to travel around, um, you know, chief traveled and still in college, he was like, checking out the world and discovering puppetry around in Europe. And he loved these epic stories, these uh, folk stories that were told by these puppets of their puppet theaters in Europe. Um, so all this sort of came together into the concept. Um, he was also very interested in what was happening with music videos at the time. Uh, Steve Barron was creating these extraordinary music videos and they were, it was almost like a new art form. Like how to really push what can you do with with video technology, and my father was very interested in what was happening with MTV and music videos. Um, and we sort of take for granted now that oh yeah, of course music video, but then it was brand new. It was very interesting. So the idea was to tell these stories in a music video style, where you're really getting in and out of the story and the narration and the story and the narration and using the blue screen setting, really experimenting with the characters. Um, then I was actually there when Duncan introduced my father to Anthony Mandela. And Anthony Mandela, as you might know, became a, an extraordinary film director and was just an amazing man. But at that time, he was a playwright. And he had just started writing for television. He had just recently done a, a television miniseries called What If It's Raining. Um, but which was hyper real. And so it was the sense, well, this is his only credit in television, and it's this hyper real drama basically about his own marriage. And can he really handle this work? And my father met Anthony, and Anthony met my father, and they immediately understood each other. And the concept was can you tell a story like jazz? And so storytelling as improv as, as you know where you're going with this. A storyteller who's so so good at his art form that he can tell a story where he's weaving in and out and in and out and bringing the images to life with the language. And one of my favorite things about the storyteller series is the language itself. It's some of the best. It's really great language. So it's also a spectacular showcase for what the Creature Shop is doing at that time. Uh, that organ, um, John Peterson, uh, that organ, fantastic organ. The White Lion is still one of my favorite puppets that was ever made by the Creature Shop. Um, I was involved, I got to help make the devils in the Soldier of Death, in this group of devils. Steve Norrington designed those devils, and they look so much like these Eastern European devils um, from great Faust, Faust stories um, that are often done by puppeteers. So, is that enough on the storyteller? But I do feel like that is a, a wonderful production. And if you guys don't know Jim Henson's storyteller, please take a look at it because it is really marvelous. And at the time, my father had so much trouble getting it on the air. Um, I think it was broadcast at like 7.30 a.m. on Saturday mornings for children. When, if you know the show, it's not where it belongs at all. And then they were able to show a few of them as part of the Jim Henson Hour, but then that was sort of complicated too and didn't really catch the audience. Um, didn't get the right audience for that show. But it was very popular in Germany and in England, and so it, did, it is known in Japan, um, but never, never found an audience here in the United States. <laughs> But some very good people who really cared about storytelling. So uh, this is this is going on lifetime. Yes, uh, November twenty first at eight right. o'clock. I think. Uh, for me personally, I don't know if I speak for anyone else. Lifetime isn't, hasn't really been on my radar <laughs> until recently <laughs> with that Will Ferrell movie. Yeah, and they're now, they're and now, yeah, and now there's this. So like, what was it like working with Lifetime? It seems like they maybe they're taking some more risks now, or uh, yeah, I mean, like, process like creatively. 
I, I think the Grumpy Cat Christmas was their first toe in the water saying let's do something crazy and edgy, and I, I think, I mean, just talking to them, I don't think it was successful as they thought it would be. It didn't kind of work out. I don't know why I was involved. Um, we did the creature shop, did build the uh, Grumpy Cats, though, the puppet Grumpy Cats. Um, it was interesting because comedy, it, it was frustrating at some points because we didn't speak the same language. You know, uh, they're not a comedy network. You know, it's not like you know, Comedy Central or HBO or they kind of know comedy. But they were really supportive. If, I, if we or Lisa and I had a, had a point we wanted to make or a, a thing we wanted to push through, if we gave a good enough reason, you know, they wouldn't just say, well, we like, we don't like that. So ultimately they were very supportive. Um, they loved the movie. I got an email after they saw the locked cut, which was about three weeks ago. Um, from the head of the network, and then she's like, we are super excited, we love this, we've been showing it around in-house, because, you know, we like three or four executives worked on it, and everyone's really excited, and they decided to promote it, so I, I think you're right, and you're assuming that they're trying to expand, I think this is more, you know, uh, like a Hallmark thing, but not a sappy, I mean, that's what's kind of nice about it, it, it rides out, because I definitely did not want, and we all learned about the lessons, you know, I mean, I, I find that stuff to be really over the top and, and kind of modeled, so, it's, it's, at least, you know, this is my taste. <laughs> I think we kind of walked that line of having it be funny and fun and warm, but not feel like you just had, you know, a four gallons of sugar syrup or down your throat. <laughs> so yeah, I, mean, I can't speak for life any more than our relationship with them, but it was good. I mean, it, it, we even left it open for a sequel. There's a, a little backdoor kind of story point in there. If, if, you know, it does well and they like it, we can do a sequel. I was just curious about the status of the Jenkins and Creature Shop Challenge, the show on the Sci Fi Channel, and whether or not I'll be right with it. Everybody asked me. It's not happening. Oh, And then, um, <laughs> what was your experience uh, working on Lazy Town? Oh, wow. I mean, did you do, were you on the pilot? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that, right? We call it Crazy Town. Um, it was insane. I, I mean, how many people have seen it? I can make this brief. Okay, so it's this guy in Iceland who's the world's aerobics champion, who was sort of a, a local boy done well, and he wanted to do, he did the stage flight with puppets, and he wanted to do it to TV series. He sold the rights to the US to Nickelodeon, and, <laughs> He wanted, he'd been given bad advice. He wanted to shoot at high def 4K before anyone had, there were four red cameras for Vipers in the world at that time. We had two of them. It was so much information that we could, <laughs> the first day of shooting, the editor came to me at the end of the day and said, you have to stop shooting. <laughs> what, what do you, we're in Iceland by the way, Reykjavik in an, in an old factory that you know, made tires or something. So, but he tricked it out. He had a lot of money up front um, and they said, you have to stop shooting. I'm like, why? Because we don't have any more storage. <laughs> and so Magnus, who was nutty, came to me, and he'd been told he could shoot the show in three days. And it was very, very camera heavy. He wanted low angles and high angles, and we'd zoom along here. And then the uh, effects guy told me, you can't move the camera. I'm like, what do you mean? He said, you can't, you can maybe do a pan. I said, why? He goes, we just don't have the technology to map the background. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, so I can't put the camera, and I can only use one take for each. And was, so that's what the editor's solution was. Pick the take in the moment that you're going to use, and then dump everything else. <laughs> Which I said, well, you're the editor. If you can live with that, that's fine. But you'll have, I mean, it's basically we're shooting almost, here's the shot, here's the shot. Um, so it was crazy. They ironed out a lot of that stuff after I did two episodes. They wanted me to stand for 20 minutes. <laughs> this is too hard. And also, Muppet Treasure Island came up uh, while I was there, and they said, hey, we're going to do this. Would you be interested? I'm like, yes, please get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> they, were, they were really nice people, and, and Magnus, as you know, is a passionate man who won't take no for an answer. And um, I could tell stories for hours about that, but uh, it, was, it was fun and crazy, but I'm glad I did Muppet Treasure Island. So. <laughs> I have two questions. The first question is, you say you found this in the archive, and are there um, going to be any others that you're looking at or actually are working on now that you can speak about? No. No. <laughs> 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 the look at each other. <laughs> no. <laughs> and the second is, when you were talking about the story, how that actually went on the other side of the box. Uh, are you planning on rebooting it? Maybe doing like 
other cultures because you get the Grecian, the European, so why not do like the Asian or even fairy tales in that kind of darker tone? We love that idea and one day we might be able to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I just wanted to first say thank you so much for bringing me um, all of Jim Henson's things to Atlanta that you have so far. I've been such a fan since I was a child. Going to the Center for Poetry Arts and seeing what they have now is amazing, so I can't wait to see what's coming. And also, is there going to be another show at the Creature Workshop with your brother? Yeah, Creature Workshop. Yeah. Yes, yes. Right now, no. I'm glad, you know, everybody's been trying to figure out, I mean, uh, at least what they've said to me is we'd love to figure out, but right now there's no plans. It was an expensive show to produce and, and sci-fi. From what I, I talked to the sci-fi effects, they were all kind of upset, and, and they said it's just they have a face-off, which costs a lot, and they felt that our show was too similar to spend that amount of money, because the competition shows don't uh, re-air, they don't uh, rerun well, because you've seen it, you know, when it's like you don't see the Bachelor of Rerun, right? So all that money spent, and for the amount of money they spend, they can do a, a, a scripted series that, you know, they can do box sets and rerun for years. So I think those were the two elements, at least, that they, they told me, which, you know, are logical. It's not like, they loved it. I mean, that, they, they were really paying the executives, like, we, it took months to figure out, I think mean, there was like six months of negotiating and trying to figure out how to do it. So it was, it was tough, but right now it's not happening. If anyone here hasn't seen it, it is really great. I love the Creature Shop Challenge. I think you can still see it on SciFi.com. I don't know. I know he's showing an Australian museum with his my friends at Weather. Like, oh, he's starting to do Kirk has a great top hat. It's a hat. Watch for hats. I'm going to go because I'm doing a presentation at the other hotel about puppetry and celebration of puppetry. And I'm going to talk a lot more about the new museum. And then tomorrow we're going to speak to, together with Kelsey Fritz from the Center for Puppetry Arts and at 1 o'clock. Um, so please come to one of those if you want to hear more about what's happening in the Center for Puppetry Arts and puppetry in general. I'll leave you to more questions. Bye. Oh, sure.
Well, you should definitely tune in. It, it, I saw a rough cut, it looks great, and um, I'm excited to see the final, especially because of the long history. I think you really captured Jim's spirit and Jerry Jewell's spirit, and um, I think everybody's going to enjoy it. I don't know. It's if you like ET, you know, there's, a, there's a friend watching. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, if you like you know, ET and those kind of fun family films where uh, like Gremlins, it's sort of like Gremlins except they never turn evil. Um, not in this episode. Not in this episode. Not in the first one. Uh, so, I don't know. I, yeah, go we'll see it. Or don't go anywhere. You can watch it your own. It requires no effort except for this. <laughs> when is it? I don't know. Saturday, November 21st. November. Yeah. 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 If you're on the screen, um, check your local listing. <laughs> <laughs> on lifetime. I'll bring you a second spot. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you.